So you already read uh, here, uh, brother uh, Austin read Matthew 17, and I told you that there might be possibly two more messages today and one more on the life of Elijah because we're done looking at his life, and now we're seeing like what happens after his life because he comes up again in the Bible. So last week we talked about uh, John the Baptist, and we'll mention him again here th uh, this morning. So John the Baptist, it said that he was Elijah. Now, we know he wasn't literally Elijah. There's no reincarnation or anything like that. But he had the spirit of Elijah. That's what I talked about last week. And then I said, there's two more things that I wanted to preach on. One, two more events. One was the, the event uh, that we just read about on the transfiguration. And then the final thing would be the two witnesses in Revelation. Well, I decide they go so well together that I'm just going to lump them into this uh, uh, message today. And so uh, we're going to talk about Elijah and Moses. That's the title of the message, just Elijah and Moses. We're going to look at how Elijah actually walks around again on the earth. And I believe both times he does that, Moses is, uh, is there as well. So we're going to take a look at that. But before I go any further than that, let's consider in the Bible different cases uh, where somebody has died and then they're seen again in some capacity. They're seen again. And I I wonder if just kind of like interaction here, if anybody could think off the top of their head any cases like that. Maybe you can think of some I didn't. I only thought of a few. Cases where somebody died and then they're seen again in some manner right, on earth before, before Elijah. I mean, I mean, I mean uh, besides Elijah and Moses. Any thoughts? S Samuel. So that's uh, one of the ones that I got. So there's a story, we won't go uh, take time to look at it, but there's a story where um, Saul, King Saul, is, uh, you know, he's troubled and he's not hearing from God, and so he wants some answers. And instead of trying to find a, a prophet, you know, who can, he, he's like, there's nobody to go to. And so he does what he was not supposed to do. In fact, God had told him to get all the, the uh, sorcerers and all that out of the land, and so he got rid of all the... The uh, uh, familiar, those who, you know, diviners and the familiar spirits and the witches and all, they got them out of the land. But then here he is like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, that one witch that we know that she's still practicing, <laughs> you know, I think I'm going to go ask her. And some of his men are like, don't do that. You're not supposed to do that. But he's like, no, 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 it'll be OK. And he goes and asks her and he's like, you know, basically, long story short, they bring up Samuel the prophet Samuel. And so Saul has a conversation with Samuel. It's a really weird encounter and it's hard to know exactly what happens. I feel like when you read that text, I probably should have taken this to it, but that's right. I feel like when you read that text, you find out that the witch is actually surprised. So probably like she didn't know that was going to happen because she's used to just faking it and pretending like people come back. And in this case, Saul, you know, Samuel actually comes back. And so it's like, whoa. So there's a case where Samuel was dead and then now he is being somehow, you know, uh, seen again. You had, you had a thought? I mean, an uh, well, example? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but they well, didn't well, die. I'm talking about someone actually yeah. dies and it comes back again. Huh? Yeah, that's good. That's a good one. Yeah, so uh, so when Jesus... Are you talking about just like, like Lazarus and, and all that? or? Okay, yeah, right, right. Yeah, those kinds of examples, right? So... So that was a slightly different situation because it was kind of like, you know, they were definitely dead. Lazarus was dead for like, like four days. And literally, like, he gets his spirit back in him and he just goes on like four days. It's like it's not enough. It was enough that the body started stinking, but not enough to where, like, you know, it was like there was no body to put the soul in, <laughs> you know, apparently. And I don't know how that would have worked otherwise. So he, he's back in his original body, okay? I'm trying to bring out some specifics because it's, it's going to be, I'm going to bring that back up here in a minute. But yeah, uh, you know, uh, so yeah, Lazarus and, and those who had been raised up. And there's a couple even the prophets brought back, like uh, the widow's son, uh, you know. There's a couple other examples like that. <clears throat> how about this? Uh, how about the rich man? You know, when he's in hell, he sees, uh, now, I guess this is slightly different because they're actually in their respective places, hell and heaven, but he actually sees Abraham. But we see that he's dead in the Bible, and then we see him, you know, talking to talking to somebody again. And, and 
you know, there's a handful of cases. There might be more, maybe you think about that I haven't, haven't really thought about and wrote down, but these are cases where you can't really say that they apply to what I'm talking about with Elijah, okay? And here's why, because of these examples that were given, and I don't think you define anything else uh, that doesn't fit this category. You either have what they're actually seeing is an apparition, like they're actually seeing basically like a, like in the case of Saul, it was like a ghost or some kind of like God allowed his spirit to be seen. You know, I don't know how, how it was in the vision where Lazarus and, and, uh, and, and he, I'm talking about not Lazarus, the rich man, and he talks to Abraham and Lazarus and, and, uh, and, and how that goes about exactly. Uh, and then the other cases where like Lazarus, for instance, you know, he, he was dead, but then he's got his soul back and he's sitting at the table. He's talking to people, same flesh and blood. Like you can go up to him. He doesn't have a new body. He's got the same flesh and blood. And, uh, and I think that's very important to understand uh, because, you know, I'm going to talk about here, you know, I'm going to combine these two stories of where we see Elijah and Moses. One has to do with the witnesses, like I said, in Revelation, and one has to do with, uh, with this transfiguration. And what I want you to notice right away is that they do not have their glorified bodies, Okay. They are being, you know, even if you can see them again and it's like an apparition, that's like a soul. There's no, you know, whatever body they have, I don't know, but it's not their glorified like body that, that they're going to get one day. And I'll, I'll break that down here in a minute. And then the other thing is, like I said, uh, you know, someone who just had their original body, you know, and even Jesus, I'm um, getting ahead of myself, but even Jesus, you know, he died three days later. He rose from the dead, but guess what? He was in his regular body, the original body that he had. Right, and then that body goes to be with the Lord, and so, uh, so let me just break these down into different points. Okay, so number one, let's talk about this. Elijah and Moses do not have glorified bodies yet. So in this story we just read, Matthew seventeen, it says, uh, "And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart." And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and, Eli and Elias, which is Elijah, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make thee a, uh, three, like, make here three tabernacles: one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake. Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, the voice of, uh, out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. I want to show you here uh, that Jesus is the first person and the only person up until, t I mean, as we speak presently, Jesus is the first and the only person who's ever risen and received a glorified body. Okay, now some people think Enoch, when he went up to heaven, he had a glorified he got a glorified body. Uh, Elijah, when he went up to heaven, he got a glorified body. And so, according to that interpretation, there's like only two people in heaven with glorified bodies, and everybody else <laughs> is not in their glorified body, right? And I don't think that's the case. I want to show you that Jesus is the first person who who did that, and he's the only person up until this time. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm looking at verse 20, but we might have to read around that here. Uh, yeah, let's back up to... Uh, back up to 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Okay, so why is he called the first fruits? He's saying because of the fact that 
this he was the first one to do that. Okay, he was the first uh, soul to be raised up in the and in, in given a glorified body, uh, and so and so this is making that uh, making that. Uh, fact right there known. Verse 21, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Okay, but every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. look at this, afterward they that are Christ at His coming. Okay, so you got Christ, there's something significant about, about His resurrection, and then afterward, those who rise at His coming, right? So we're talking about at the coming of Christ, what we call the resurrection, then all those who are dead in Christ will receive their glorified bodies, and we will do the same thing that, uh, that Christ did, okay? So uh, Jesus the first and the only person to receive glorified bodies in this fashion so far. And, uh, and, and so He rises from, when you see... Uh, when you follow the story in the gospel accounts, he rises from the dead, right? Which means his soul, you know, the Bible says went down to hell and he comes back and he's, and he's back in the body of Jesus, right? So all of a sudden they come and, and he's not there. Why? He didn't just vanish. He just like got up and walked out. Like the angel rolled the stone away and he got up and he walked out in his physical body, all right? But then we find that, uh, in fact, uh, go to John 20. Go to John 20. John chapter 20. Look at verse 17. <clears throat> well, let's back up a little bit. I'm sorry. Uh, let's go with... Uh, let's go all the way back up to 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down, and looking into the sepulcher... And seeth two angels in white sitting, and one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou, have, uh, uh, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabbani, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend up unto the father, uh, uh, up and, uh, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your Father, your God. So here he is walking around in his his normal body that now has life again. Right now, I don't know how it had been cleaned. You know, are all the the stripes still on his back? You know, he's missing some hair where they had pulled out his beard. You know, uh, scars where the crown of thorns had been put. I don't know what the body looked like at this point, but I'm telling you, he was back in the same body that he had before. And whenever she comes up to him, he's like, ah, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended up to my father. Now here's an interesting thing. Uh, I might be reading into this a little bit, but you know, there were rules and it wasn't just for the Nazarites. Uh, there were rules about not touching unclean things. And if someone has been dead for four days, you know, that's an unclean thing. You wouldn't want to uh, go about touching it, no doubt. But regardless, for whatever reason, he says, hey, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended up to the Father, indicating that He's going to go up to the Father in the body that He had, and somehow that body is going to be translated into a glorified body. Okay, so, so now look at Luke chapter 24. And as you follow on the line of what happens, okay, Christ rises from the dead, He ascends up to the Father, and he's given, a he's given a glorified body. Now he's going to come back down and he's going to meet with this. I remember she said, go tell the disciples, I go to my, I, I, I'm going, I'm ascending up to the Father and to your Father and my God and your God. And then he tell, so he tells them that. Now he's going to come and he's going to meet up with them later on. Luke chapter 24, look at verse uh, 39. Sorry. 
So now he's standing before his disciples and he says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit have not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Now some have pointed out that he doesn't say flesh and blood. He says flesh and bones. And so the indication is that, hey, we don't have in our glorified bodies, maybe we don't have blood, but it's just the spirit that's in us. Like, I don't know. I can't make those those leaps exactly, but I'm just saying he says, he's now telling, at first it was like, hey, don't touch me. I haven't ascended up to my father. Now he's saying, handle me, touch me, right? So it appears to me like that means he's ascended up to the father. Now he's come back down and he's being seen in his glorified, uh, glorified body. All right. And so <clears throat> all we have in the Bible as an example, you know, about what's going to happen to us in, in the end time and the resurrection is what we've seen with Jesus. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15 again. First Corinthians 15, let's start with verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached uh, that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? I already, started, I already read this. Okay, let me see how far do I want to go. 20... Uh, 24, then come at the end, uh, or I already read 23 where it said, Christ, the first fruits afterward, they that are Christ that is coming, then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom uh, to God, even the father, which he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Okay. And so, uh, uh, let me see here. Then you go down there, verse 39, he starts talking about the different types of flesh. Uh, he says in verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption and it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor and is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness and it is raised in power. It is sown in natural body. It is raised in a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made, that's talking about Jesus, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, uh, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and after that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord uh, from heaven. As is the earthly, such, uh, such are they also that are earthly. And as is heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. This is like when Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, that which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. I'm going to tell you this. If, if people in the world today would get this distinction down, it would help clarify so much of the Bible. Look, you have a, you have a physical body, a natural body, and you have a spiritual body. Once you're born, once you're born of God, you, know, you now have an inner man and the outer man. So you're reading the Bible and it's addressing the outer man. And it's talking about how the, the how this we ought to you know discipline this body and do all those kinds of things. We're not, not talking about the spiritual man. Therefore, we're not talking about salvation because it's the spiritual man that is saved. Does that make sense? So the inner man is the one who is sinless because the inner man is born of Christ. It's got Christ, you know, uh, a spirit. And so uh, and so so big. I mean, and if people would just get that, but people don't understand that, and so they combine scriptures and they combine like what is spiritual and what is uh, fleshly. And this is where people get so off on salvation. Even people who should know better, but they misinterpret Scripture because they don't understand this. And so here's what he's saying real clearly. He's saying, look, you have an earthly body and you have a heavenly body, okay? But our heavenly body is not complete yet. It's not it's been given that glorified body, the, 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 the shell, if you will, that we're going to have for all eternity. Okay, he says, and uh, uh, let me see here. Let's go down to 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, what does he mean, thou shall, we shall not all sleep? Well, in the Bible, a lot of times when it talks about sleep, it's actually talking about death. Okay, and I'm not talking about like the Jehovah's Witness view of like soul sleep, where they say, well, your soul just kind of sleeps until the resurrection and then the soul rises, but the body doesn't rise. That's not what the Bible's talking about. Okay, uh, but what the Bible says, basically, when you are, quote unquote, dead in Christ, you're not really dead at all. Because it's that spiritual man we're talking about, right? That spiritual man doesn't die. You know, whenever you pass from this life, boom, you're, you're in glory. Like you're in heaven. And so, uh, and so here's what he's saying. 
We shall not all sleep, meaning not everybody on this earth, you know, not necessarily in this generation, but at some generation in the future, uh, not everybody will uh, die. I mean, obviously, as a point on a man wants to die, we understand uh, that, that scenario, but there's one exception to that, and that's those who are alive at the coming of Christ, at the rapture, right? And so he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible, right, we're talking about the natural man, shall be put on, uh, shall put on incorruption, that's talking about the, the spiritual man, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Okay, so we have an example of what happened with Christ as far as receiving a glorified body and his resurrection and all that. But there's no other example where anybody else in the Bible had that happen to him. Christ is the first. And it says that the next will be at the, at the, at the rapture is what we call it. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but the, at the second coming or the resurrection. Okay, uh, uh, that's where we will, you know, get the glorified bodies. Okay, so why did I say that? Because now people will wonder, well, what about Elijah and Moses? You know, this is what the message is about, right? The title is Elijah and Moses. Why are you talking about Jesus? Well, here's why. Because if, if we understand that, then we understand that Moses and Elijah, they did not have a glorified body at, that, at that, the time of this transfiguration. So they weren't literally seeing like the raised body, you know, of, of, a, of Moses and Elijah and glorified, you know, with a glorified body or anything like that. What they're seeing is simply like some kind of apparition or uh, something of that of that nature okay and i would even suspect that and i'm getting ahead of myself a little bit but i would suspect that what they're seeing is what is going to happen in the last day okay as, in the resurrection and i'll talk about that here in a minute notice uh uh let's see here okay so back to our text in matthew 17 everybody's still with me right Matthew 17, look at verse 7. Uh, let me see here. Matthew 17, what did I say, verse 7? Okay, yeah. All right, so notice this. So the disciples here... God's voice saying, this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. And uh, they fall on their face. And then Jesus comes and he touches them and he says, arise and be not afraid. Verse eight says, and when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. So it's like when Jesus physically put his hand on them, it like snaps them back into reality, you know what I mean? Or whatever, into the physical mode and the vision is gone. Right. So we understand that what they're seeing is somewhat of a type of a vision or something like that. OK, look at. Uh, uh, let me see here. Look at verse four and five. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us uh, to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. Now, here's something to notice whenever you read that. This is problematic because what they're doing is they're putting what Peter's doing, at least, is he's putting Elijah and Moses on the same plane as Jesus. And they're looking at this vision and they're thinking about this and they're like, oh, wow, this is great. Elijah's come back. Moses has come back. Let's make a tabernacle, which is kind of like a, a, a tent. You know, let's make a dwelling place for all three of you. You know, and, and, and they saw Jesus transfigured, he's like light, and, and then he sees these other guys, and he's just like, oh, this is amazing. We're going to build. So then this vision or whatever is ended with this, uh, with this bright cloud that comes over in the voice of God that says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And it's almost like he's saying like, hey, you know what? Now I showed you this, but here's the lesson that I want you to learn. 
don't get all caught up into the spiritism and like the, the visions and all this kind of stuff. I have given you Jesus. He's in your presence. You can hold him. You can touch him. You can feel him. And he's right there and he's delivering the message for you. He's the one that you need to listen to. Right. Because remember, you know, it was real big for people to seek signs and just want to have like like miracles and all this kind of stuff. And he's saying, no, you need to believe in Jesus Christ. Look at Second Peter one real quick. Peter learns this lesson and uh, he, he understands it. And so when he read when he uh, writes his letters here, epistles. First and second Peter, he, he gets to second Peter. Look at chapter one. And uh, verse 17, 2 Peter 1, 17 says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard. All right, this is Peter talking. Peter was the one that was right there in Matthew 17. Okay, He said, this is what we heard. I uh, lost my spot there. Um, uh, when we were with him in the Holy Mount, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophet came not in old time by the will of but holy men of God spake as they were moved of the, by the Holy Ghost. What's he saying? He's saying, look, but we have a more sure word. He's like, you know, yeah, I was there when I saw the transfiguration. And I saw Christ transfigured and I saw Elijah and I saw Moses. He's like, but you know what? Who cares about that vision? We have a more sure word of testimony. And then he begins to talk about the Bible and he says, you know, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. He's like, uh, you know, holy men of God spake this and it was passed down. And then this is what we have. This is the record of God. This is like God's voice, right? This is what's called the word of God. This is like vo God's voice saying, you know, this is my beloved son and whom he, <laughs> you know, this is where we get our information. We don't have to look for visions. We don't have to have the signs and apparitions and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and dreams and, and all this kind of stuff. We don't need that. Okay? We have a more sure word. And so it's like God was using, some, for some reason, He was using that, that transfiguration and Moses and Elijah, that, that vision or whatever, to show them this. But I want to show you something else. Okay, This brings me to my last point. Back to Matthew 17 again. <coughs> So my last point is this, Elijah and Moses will be the next two, or at least among the next 144,000. <laughs> okay, I'm getting, you have to bear with me for a minute. He'll be the next two, or at least among the, the, the next 144,000 who will receive their glorified bodies. Okay, uh, and before I, I show you that in Revelation about the two witnesses, all right, we started this reading in chapter 7. 17, sorry. Chapter 17 of Matthew is where we talk about the uh, transfiguration. Back up one verse. And this is Jesus' words. He says, Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Now, this is speculation. I don't know this 100%, but it seems like going from those words into the transfiguration tells us that what Jesus was talking about, saying, hey, there's some of you standing right here that are going to see the Son of Man coming, right? And, and, and so it seems as though what he's talking about is what's going to happen in this transfiguration. They are going to get a glimpse. They're going to get a vision of, of Christ coming in His glory, okay? That's why you read about Christ in Revelation, and He's this bright light, and He's all this. And so this is what, in the transfiguration, He's seeing this, that Christ is like this light, then he also, then he, they also see Elijah and they see Moses. Okay, now why is that significant? I believe. Here's what I believe. This is a reference to the two witnesses. Now go to Revelation chapter six. Now why did I even bring up the 144,000? What's that have to do with the two witnesses? Look at Revelation chapter six. And again, I'm. Um, you know, if you're looking for a Sunday morning, just hard preaching or something like that, you know, this isn't it. This isn't the message, but this is some good stuff. Okay, this is from God's Word. Let's, uh, 
Let's stay keyed in. All right, Revelation chapter 6, look at verse 9. <clears throat> and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Okay, now, what's going on up until this point in the book of Revelation is we're seeing the same events that Jesus talked about on the Mount of Olives. And uh, you can go to Matthew 24 and read about that. And what he's talking about, the events that are going to happen in the last days, okay? And he talks about how Christians are going to be persecuted. Now, a lot of people say, no, 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 it's not talking about the Christians. That's talking about the Jews. I'm like, well, how do you know that? I know you've been told that, but how do you know that? And they'll say, well, look, he's talking to Jews. No, he's talking to disciples. Disciples clearly came out of Judaism, or they were supposed to, at least Jesus was wanting them to. And they became Christians and they started the church. And so people that are like, oh, no, no, there's a distinction between the church and Israel. Well, guess what? The disciples probably should have been part of that distinction, don't you think? <laughs> and he's talking to the disciples, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. So he's talking to the disciples, saying like, you, uh, you know, are you meaning, you know, because they're starting the church, the church is going to go through tribulation, persecution, and all that, okay? Now, there's, there's differences of opinions as to the, you know, what happens in the seven years, of, you know, some people call the whole seven years tribulation and all that kind of stuff. Here's all I know, that in Revelation, when we get to what I just read, right, it's very clear at this midpoint, they're looking and they're saying, how long, Lord, before you, you, you uh, avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? In verse 11, so you're in Revelation 6, verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also uh, and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And this is what I believe is called the great tribulation. There's a small time, just a little bit of section right before Christ's coming, okay, where they're going through this. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and I don't have time to preach on this. I preached on Revelation and everything, but when he talks about all these different seals, if you think about a scroll and it's got all these seals on it, when he gets to that last seal and it's broken, now he can open up the scroll, okay? And so Everything that we see after he opens up the scroll is something completely different than those seals, okay? Uh, and so he says, I beheld, uh, and opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell upon the earth, uh, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. The, the, uh, the skies be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall sound. How's, how's that first go? We ought to sing that one to end with. Uh, the trump shall resound. And the Lord shall descend, right? Even so it is well with my soul. That's what he's talking about, right? The heavens depart as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every uh, free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Okay, so what is going on here is... The heavens roll back as a scroll, as a scroll and uh, the uh, blood, the moon is, is, is like blood and, and all these signs that have been said if, since Joel chapter 2 and all throughout the Bible that this is when the Lord's coming back. All these things happen. When he comes back, what happens? He takes the believers up to heaven, right, to be with him. And now he's going to pour out his wrath upon the earth. But God is so good that he's never going to leave the world without some kind of a witness. Okay, so here's what it begins in chapter seven. Right away, it begins talking about the 144,000 and there's, you know, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And all these people are witnesses and they're sealed on their forehead. And uh, none of the plagues are going to affect them because they're sealed, but they're still going to be on the earth during that time of God's wrath being poured out. Okay, where did this, this 144,000 come from? 
Well, if you watch Tim LaHaye, which I don't even know, I don't think I've ever read anything from, <laughs> from him, but you watch the Left Behind series or watch anything, they're going to say probably that the 144,000 are these Jews that in the tribulation just all of a sudden are just like, whoa, we better get right with the Lord. And so then they turn to the Lord and then they become, there's only 144,000 of them that happen to be male, all male, happen to be virgins and happen to be from each of the 12 tribes, all right? But that's not what I believe is going on here. Where's this 144,000? Remember, the rapture just happened. So when the rapture happens and the dead in Christ rise, 144,000 remain on the earth. This is what I believe. The rest of them go up to be with the Lord for a period of time into the millennial kingdom. This 144,000, they're appointed to this special job and they're sealed on their foreheads. Now, I think, I don't know for sure, the two witnesses might be separate, but I think probably the two witnesses are just part of this 144,000 that were risen from the dead. Now look, if you were going through the Bible and you say, hey, God's going to pick 144,000 throughout history of saints that are going to remain on the earth during the, during the wrath of God, and they're going to be sealed, and they're going to go out preach mightily to people. Now, I don't think very many, if anybody, is going to get saved during this preaching. I think it's going to fall on deaf ears, much like mo, mo, much like uh, Noah when he preached in the 120 days, uh, I mean, 120 years up leading up to the uh, flood. Uh, you know, he he was preaching, uh, you know, righteousness, but nobody listened. They didn't get in the ark, right? And I think that's what's going to happen with the 144,000 and with the two witnesses. They're going to be preaching, and no one's going to listen to them, right? They're all just like their hearts are hardened. They've received the mark of the beast and all this kind of stuff, and they're not going to listen. But that doesn't mean God's going to leave the earth without a witness. So he's going to bring up some mighty men who are going to do these miracles and these wonders, and they're going to be bold, and they're going to do... Wouldn't you think, like, of that 144,000, like, you just start picking characters out of the Bible, you'd be like, I think Moses would probably be one of those guys. I think Elijah would probably be one of those guys, <laughs> right? Okay, so let's go then to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Now remember, up until this point, Elijah and Moses, since they died, you say, wait a minute. We know Elijah went up in a whirlwind. We, and, and, and some have speculated that Moses never died either because uh, they never found his body and all that if you read about his death. So some people have supposed that. But, but look, however they went to go be with the Lord, their body perished somehow. Whether it was like in the atmosphere on their way up to heaven or whether it was just like, you know, whatever the case, you know, they went to be with the Lord. Yes, we don't know anything about their death, but, you know, they, they, they weren't in their glorified bodies. Okay, because we know that because the Bible says there's Jesus and the next will be the those who come who, who rise at Christ's uh, second coming. All right. So in chapter 11, you know, we Yes, we had the transfiguration, but Elijah and Moses have not been on the earth yet. After the rapture, they're there, and I believe they're left here with the 144,000. It says, And there was given me a reed like unto the rod, uh, like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar uh, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's three, that's three and a half years, okay? Clothed in sackcloth. Now look at this part. These are the two olive trees. Now we're not going to go there, but you'd have to go to Zechariah. I think it's chapter 4. And it describes this, right? It doesn't say a whole lot about it, but it describes the whole, the two olive trees that God will anoint, okay? And it says, And the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And look at this. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. Wouldn't that be a great superpower to have? <laughs> Somebody's going to hurt you, man. Fire just comes out of their mouth. Just, you know, just demolished them with the fire and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now look at this. These, talking about these two witnesses, these have power to shut up heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Now who, who did that? Who had power to shut up heaven and it rain not? Elijah, right? Very clearly. And in the days of his prophecy, when he was a prophet on this earth, 
you know, that's what he did. That's what he's known for doing. Ahab was like, hey, you trouble Israel. And he's like, no, I just did that, you know, because God is punishing you. So these have power to shut up heaven and it rain not in the days of his prophecy. And let's talk about the other guy. Have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. All right, now, who do we see in the Bible that smote the water and it turned into blood and smote, you know, with all these plagues? Moses. So it makes sense that these two witnesses are Moses and Elijah. It makes sense that those are the ones that Jesus was talking about at the transfiguration or, or why he was showing them in the transfiguration and possibly why he said, hey, some of you guys here are going to see me, you know, in my coming, you know, at, and, and he's describing this time. So they were seeing a vision of what's going to happen one day. We don't know when that day is going to be at the at the resurrection. <clears throat> and uh, and that would uh, that would just uh, that would make sense that these are the people that are being talked about. Now, obviously, it's possible that God could empower anybody to do those same types of miracles. But doesn't it seem quite, you know, significant that God mentions those things? And doesn't it seem odd that he would just have like, you know, just randomly just Moses and, and, uh, and Elijah to be up on the earth? But I think when you think about it in terms of, OK, now that the resurrection has happened, the rapture has happened and the dead in Christ have risen, you know, now uh, there are people that were literal Bible characters of the past who are now present on earth and some of them stay behind. So just like these two witnesses, the 144,000 who might, these two witnesses might be part of that or might not. Uh, this is talking about, um, about those guys. So, uh, so yeah, already, uh, yeah. So anyways, I, I, so I think, I think you're all on the same page. I think everybody followed pretty well. Uh, look, we have the privilege, right? We have the privilege of one day. We're all going to die. But when we die, boy, we're just dead in Christ, which means actually we're sleeping. Our soul is, uh, is, is to, it, with the Lord, but the body is just kind of absent for a little while. And then once he, uh, the rapture comes, we're given our glorified bodies. And we are going to have the opportunity to walk around in glorified bodies just like Elijah and just like Moses we don't know, uh, you, you know, uh, we, we, we know that when this body dies, you know, we're, we go to be with the Lord. The Bible makes that really clear, right? And, and how long those, you know, some people have been there for a very long time waiting on the, uh, the return of Christ and the, and the rapture and all that. When that comes, we will have glorified bodies uh, if we're saved. If we're saved. Now, Revelation 20 talks about the second resurrection, and you don't, want to, you don't want to be part of the second resurrection. You want to be part of the first resurrection and receive a glorified body, okay? Second resurrection happens after the millennium, and it's made up of all those who are going to stand before the uh, great white throne of God and be judged according to their works, and nobody's going to make it, all right, because you, nobody was good enough to go to heaven. And so you want to be part of those who, whose name was written down in the book of life, and you're saved, and you're never going to die. You know, the Bible makes that very clear. Uh, you won't ever die. This this body will, but this is this isn't us. You know, this is just the natural man, but the the, the inner man. That's the part of us that's going to go to be with the Lord. <clears throat> also, we need to realize that hey, you know, I don't think that the hundred forty four thousand and the two witnesses are going to have a huge impact as far as as reaching the lost for Christ. But here's what the Bible says: It says, before any of these things happen, the gospel is going to go into the whole world. Okay, that's in Matthew twenty four. It says, before any of those things happen, the gospel is going to be preached to the whole world. Now, that's the time that we live in. Now, I'm not saying that we're in the, the last of the last times. I mean, sometimes I think we are. Sometimes I think the mark of the beast is like just right around the corner, <laughs> you know. But I don't know. You know, if I had to estimate how much time I got, can I go down another rabbit hole? No, I better not. If I had to estimate, I don't think we're going to be long, here longer than a thousand, uh, a thousand years uh, more. And I'm not trying to... I'm not trying to set any dates or anything like that. Uh, I have a reason for that. I'll have to explain it in another message. <laughs> okay, but, uh, but, the, but the thing is, we are living in a time where, you know, no matter how hard it gets to witness, no matter how much Christians might get persecuted, which in America, at least, we're not really persecuted that bad at this point, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the world, we're not. Uh, uh, no matter how hard, we have the opportunity, we have the liberty 
And we have the power to go boldly in the name of Jesus and preach like an Elijah, like a Moses. And we can preach the gospel while we still have, while the world still has time to hear that and to be saved. It says, the Bible says, behold, now is the day of salvation. And so we need to go out and we need to spread the gospel and keep doing the work. That's what we're here for. You know, otherwise, why didn't we just go up like Elijah in a chariot of fire and just go up to be with the Lord? Uh, because he's got a work for us to do. And so we've got to uh, keep that in mind. And all the other things of this world are just temporal. They're just going to pass. They're not important. We need to be focused on the spiritual. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for uh, the truths uh, that are found here. Some hard to understand. I believe everything I just uh, shared today is pretty uh, clear and, uh, and uh, seems hard to refute. Uh, if I'm wrong, Lord, I pray that you help me to have uh, wisdom in that. Uh, but I do know one thing for sure, that you're coming back and you'll receive your, uh, your children. And, uh, and we will go up to be with you for eternity. And so I pray, Lord, that you'll just help us redeem the time, make the most use of it as we can on this earth to do great works for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.